Yes, guys. So let's get into the concepts of Indies one zero nine now. Guys, Indies one zero nine particularly talks about recognition and measurement of your financial assets and financial liabilities. So when I talk about this recognition and measurement, you need to first understand that recognition and measurement is depending upon the classification of financial assets and financial liabilities. Depending upon the classification of financial assets and financial liabilities, they should be recognized or uh, they should be measured as on each balance sheet date uh, in your financial statements so that means the classification becomes the most important aspect without the classification you cannot get into measurement or recognition aspects so let's talk about classification so i will break this classification into two parts financial asset classification separate and financial liability classification separate first let's primarily talk about financial asset which is a very detailed discussion that we go into when I talk about classification of financial assets, you need to understand that the financial assets can be classified into three categories. First one is called as financial assets measured at amortized cost. Next one, financial assets measured at fair value through p &L. Third one, financial assets measured at fair value through OCI. These are the three fundamental classifications of a financial asset. So any financial asset in the enterprise should either be classified as financial assets measured at amortized cost or they can be measured at fair value through PL or they can be measured at fair value through OC. Now, how do you determine where each financial asset should be categorized? Should it be categorized as amortized cost or should it be categorized as fair value through PL or should it be classified at fair value through OCI? This depends upon two basic tests. First test for classification is called as instrument level test. In an instrument level test, I'll apply something called as a test for the instrument. This test is called as CCPI, solely for payment of principal and interest. That means in a contractual cash, if the contractual cash flows arising from the instrument are in the form of principal and interest, if the contractual cash flows arising from the instrument are in the form of principal and interest then you will basically say that the CCFC test or the contractual cash flow test is satisfied. This CCFC test contractual cash flow test is an instrument level test that means every financial asset has to be first put into the instrument level test which is called as CCFC test. Under the CCFC test we will assess whether the instrument is deriving cash flows solely in the form of principal and interest. If it is deriving cash flow solely in the form of principal and interest, then we call such kind of instruments as debt instruments. We call such kind of instruments as debt instruments as per instrument level test. If your contractual cash flow test is not satisfied, that means the cash flows arising from the instrument are not solely in the form of principal and interest then we will say that the contractual cash flow test is not satisfied and they should not be classified as equity in, uh, debt instruments but they in turn should be classified as equity instrument or a derivative instrument. So I am primarily saying under classification of financial assets I will first put them through an instrument level test. Under an instrument level test I will have a test called as CCFC contractual cash flow test where the cash flows arising from the instrument are solely in the form of principal and interest. If this test is satisfied, they are debt instruments. If they are not satisfied, they are equity instruments or a derivative instrument. Clear? That is the first test that we apply for classification of financial assets called as instrument level test. The subsequent test after the instrument level test, after applying the instrument level test and classifying your financial assets into debt instruments or other than debt instruments then I'll apply something called as business model test. This test is called as entity level test. So first one was instrument level test. Second one is entity level test. A business model test is called as a BM uh, sorry an instrument level test is called as contractual cash flow test while your entity level testing is called as a business model test. Business model test. If I apply to a debt instrument, the business model test, then I will have to see whether the intention of the enterprise, the intention of the enterprise 
is to derive cash flows from this financial asset until maturity in the form of principal and interest only. My intention is to derive cash flows from this instrument in the form of principal and interest only. Then I will say that this business model test is satisfied. The other two instances which can emerge is where the business intention is probably to trade with this financial asset. A debt instrument which is held for the purpose of trade or which is held with an intention to sell. So that is as not uh, that is a situation where the business model test is not satisfied. So based on these two tests that is instrument level test and business model test we will have to continue with classification of financial assets. Let's look at the classification then. Your classification of financial assets are predominantly into two tests. The first test is called as instrument level test where we apply contractual cash flow testing. Second one is in entity level testing which is called as business model test. First when I apply instrument level test I will see whether the contractual cash flows arising from a financial asset are solely in the form of principal and interest. Based on your instrument level test I can divide the classification into two types of instrument debt instrument and equity instrument. Coming down to entity level testing which is subsequent test after the instrument level test I will apply a business model test. Under a business model test I will try to determine what is the objective of the enterprise to derive benefit from the financial asset. Do I want to derive benefit from the financial asset by holding it until maturity to derive the cash flows or do I have an intention to sell this uh, uh, financial asset to derive cash flows or is it a combination of both? That means I want to, I intend to derive cash flows until a particular point of time. Subsequent to that, I want to derive cash flows from sale of this. So that is a combination of both. So these two tests are significantly applied to any financial asset to help for the classification. Based on these two tests, the financial asset should be classified into three categories. Financial assets measured at amortized cost, your financial assets measured at fair value through PNL and finally financial assets measured at fair value through OCI. Now, I'll look at the measurement at a later point of time, but look at here. If I have to classify the financial assets as amortized cost, then you have to make sure that as per the CCFT test, it should be a debt instrument only. An equity instrument cannot be classified as financial asset measured at amortized cost. So that means that financial asset should derive cash flows only solely from the payment of principal and interest. And under business model test, it should be the intention of the enterprise to derive benefit from the financial asset to uh, hold it till maturity and receive cash flows in the form of principal and interest. That means if I apply CCFC test, then it is a debt instrument. That means it derives cash flow solely from payment of principal and interest. And it is the business intention also to hold it till maturity and derive cash flows in the form of principal and interest. Then you can classify this instrument as an amortized cost. I think this is a better way of representing. So first a financial asset is put into instrument level test and we apply a debt instrument and other than debt instrument. The debt instruments then put into a business model test if they are expected to derive cash flows or if it is the intention of the enterprise to derive cash flows solely for from principal and interest then it can be classified as AC amortized cost. But if your business model test is to derive a benefit from the financial asset as a combination of both to receive principal and interest to a certain point of time and then subsequently sell the instrument then you will classify this instrument as an FET OCI. If it is neither of that, I neither have an intention to hold it for maturity, I neither have an intention to hold it initially and then sell it, that means my intention is predominantly to trade with this financial asset, then I will classify it as FET PL, fair value through PNL. If applying an instrument level test, let's say a financial asset is no longer a debt instrument, that means it is not deriving cash flows in the form of payment of principal and interest and should be classified as other than debt instrument. Then under other than debt instrument, there are two types of instrument. One is called as an equity instrument. Other one is called as a derivative instrument. The easiest part is derivative instrument. 
because there is no further application of entity level test. Whenever you say by instrument level testing, that is a contractual cash flow test, a particular instrument is a derivative, then the derivative instrument should always be classified as FATPL. There is no chance of any other classification for a derivative instrument. But if it is an equity instrument, that means it is not deriving cash flows in the form of principal and interest. It signifies equity interest of another enterprise. For example, it is uh, an investment in shares of emphasis. It is an investment in shares of reliance. In such case, or an, in, in, an instrument of mutual fund, then in such case, I'll have to apply a business model test where I will see if it is held for trade. It is held for trading means what? My intention is to derive cash flows from sale of that instrument. In such case, it should be classified as FATPL. If it is not held for the purpose of trade, that means you don't want to derive cash flows from sale of the instrument, then I'll apply the second level of testing where I will see whether it is designated as an FATOCI. That means it is an intention of the management if they want to classify it as FATOCI or not. If they want to classify it as FATOCI, they can present that equity instrument as fair value through OCI. But if they do not designate it as FATOCI, it should always be classified as FATPL. That means an equity instrument can never be classified as amortized cost. An equity instrument should either be classified as FATPL or should be classified as FATOCI. When should it be classified as FATOCI? I'll classify an equity instrument as FATOCI only if it is not held for trading. It is not held for trading and it is specifically design designated as FATOCI by the management. Only such situation, I will classify an equity instrument as FATOCI in any other situation. That is, an equity instrument is held for the purpose of trade or it is not designated as FATOCI. I will classify such equity instruments as FATPL. Clear? I'll repeat. I said a financial asset should be classified as amortized cost only if it is a debt instrument. No equity instrument in any circumstance should be measured at amortized cost. If a debt instrument has to be classified at amortized cost, then the entity level or entity's intention is to derive cash flows from this instrument from only in the form of principal and interest until maturity then you can classify the debt instrument as amortized cost. Best examples that you can give here is rental deposits, debtors and cash and bank. These are having an intention to derive only principal and interest, therefore should be classified as amortized cost. But a debt instrument can also be classified as FET OCI instead of amortized cost. When does that arise? When it is a debt instrument and the intention of the management is to derive cash flows from principal and interest initially, but with an intention of subsequent sale, then in such situation, I will classify such debt instrument as FET OCI. An equity instrument should be classified as FET OCI only if, only if, number one, it is not an equity instrument which is held for trade and it is specifically designated by the management as FETOCI. A debt instrument can be classified as FETPL if it can neither be classified as amortized cost nor be classified as FETPL or it can be irrevocably designated at the inception of the arrangement itself as a FETPL. Irrevocably designated means as the instrument arises, it is a debt instrument and the intention of the management is to always carry it at FETPL. That is irrevocable. That means you cannot reshift it again. So it is designated at the inception as FETPL. An equity instrument can be classified as FETPL only if it is not specifically designated as FETOCI or the equity instrument is held for the purpose of trading. Clear? Have a good look at whatever is being written out there in this particular slide because this particular slide will give you a lot of inputs on when to classify each instrument either as FATPL or FATOCI or amortized cost. It completely depends upon two tests that is amortized that, that is your instrument level test and your business model test.
Yes, guys. So I'll repeat what I just said. I was discussing the concept of classification of financial assets. And I told you classification is the underlying principle which gives rise to your measurement and recognition. That's why we have to understand classification before we get into recognition and measurement. Under classification, I told you that we apply two types of tests. First one which we apply is called as instrument level test. Under an instrument level test, I need to apply or I need to understand what is the nature of the instrument. I need to understand the nature of financial asset. A financial asset, if it has a nature to derive cash flows solely in the form of principal and interest, then I will say that the CCFC test, contractual cash flow test is satisfied. That is the instrument level test. Best examples to satisfy an instrument level test are debtors, bills receivable, bill, uh, uh, your uh, deposits, fixed deposit, uh, your deposits, that, that is your rental deposits or fixed deposits, any advances given, all these are primarily applied to instrument level tests. Clear? So they are satisfying instrument level tests. If your CCFC test is not satisfied, then I will call them either as equity instrument or can be called as debt instrument. But if some instrument satisfies the CCFC test, that means it derives cash flow solely from principal and interest, then it should be classified only as a debt instrument. Once I apply the instrument level test, the next level of testing or next tier of testing is called as entity level test. This is called as business model test. Under a business model, I'll test the intention of the enterprise. How does the intention, how does the enterprise expect to re realize benefits from the financial asset? If I want to derive the benefit from financial asset by holding it till maturity, or do I expect to derive benefit by sale, or do I expect benefits to be derived from holding it for a particular period of time and subsequently selling it? In such case, I'll go with this particular classification. Financial assets first by instrument level test are classified into debt instruments, equity instruments and derivative instruments. First under debt instruments. Under debt instruments first I'll apply business model test and if it satisfies the business model test to, to with the intention of the enterprise to hold the instrument till maturity and to derive cash flows only in the form of principal and interest I'll classify it as amortized cost. If my intention of the enterprise regarding the debt instrument is to derive cash flows initially from principal and interest but subsequently from sale, I'll classify the debt instrument as equity OCI. My instrument has no intention at all. My intention is neither to hold it till maturity nor to hold it initially for principal and interest and subsequently to sell. That means you have an intention to sell the instrument right up front. In such situation, I classified as FTPL. Instead of applying all these three classification, a debt instrument at the inception itself, the management can irrevocably designate it as FTPL. Without applying a business model test, I have directly a benefit or I have an option to basically designate it as FTPL at the inception itself. These are the three possible classifications for debt instrument. However, when I come to equity instrument, they can either be classified as FTPL or they can be classified as FTOCI. For me to classify an equity instrument as FTOCI, it should be an equity instrument which is not held for the purpose of trade and it should be specifically designated as OCI. If the equity instrument is held for trade, it should be treated as FTPL or if an equity instrument is not held for trade, but not designated as FTOCI, then it should be again treated as FTPL or it should be classified as FTPL. A derivative instrument will not go through all this process. A derivative instrument should always be classified as FTPL only. Clear? That is when I played you this slide, which gives me a holistic understanding of how each financial asset is being classified. An amortized cost can only be a debt instrument where the enterprise has an intention to derive cash flows until maturity only from principal and interest. While a debt instrument can be an OCI as well, if the intention of the enterprise is to derive cash flows from principal and interest initially and to derive cash flows from subsequent sale. An equity instrument can be classified as a FTOCI, 
when it is not held for trade and it is specifically designated as FETOCI. A debt instrument can be classified as FETOS, FETPL irrevocably at the time of inception or if a financial uh, if the equity instrument can neither be classified as amortized cost nor being classified as FETOCI. However, an equity instrument can be classified as FETPL only if it is held for the purpose of trade or if it is not held for trade but not designated as FETOCI. Derivative instruments are always FETPL. Clear? This is regarding my classification of financial assets into three categories amortized cost, FETOCI, and FETPL. So, in this process of classification, we have understood two types of testing instrument level testing and entity level test. First is the instrument level test where I apply CCFC test, contractual cash flow test to identify the nature of the instrument. So by identifying the nature of the instrument, I classified it into three categories. Equity, debt, derivative. Once I identified the instrument level test that is CCFC test, I'll put it to a business model test. Under a business model test, I'll, I'll identify the intention of the management to derive cash flows from the instrument. Does the management intend to derive cash flows by holding it to maturity or does the management intend to derive cash flows from sale of the asset or does the management intend to uh, derive cash flows from a combination of both. These are the two types of testing based on which I classified my financial assets into these three categories amortized cost, FETPL and FETOCI. Clear?
Now that we have understood the classification of financial assets, now let's look into the measurement of financial assets based on that classification that we have seen now. According to our discussion regarding classification, I told you that a financial asset can be either classified as amortized cost or can be classified as fair value through PNL or fair value through other comprehensive income, FET, OCI. So AC, FETPL, FET, OCI. Let's see now how does they how do they measure these instruments based on their classification. When I go as per the classification and my measurement model should go like this. If it is an amortized cost, then initially, oh, sorry, whether it is amortized cost or FET OCI or FET PL, initial measurement of a financial asset should always be at fair value. Initial measurement should always be at fair value. It is a subsequent measurement that is on balance sheet date where the change actually occurs. According to your subsequent measurement on balance sheet date, if I have classified a debt instrument as amortized cost, then it should be it should be subsequently measured at amortized cost using an effective interest rate. I will tell you what is this amortized cost using effective interest rate. I'll take the help of an example and I'll come up. Any debt instrument or an equity instrument which is either classified as fair value through other comprehensive income or fair value through PNL, both the cases it should be measured at fair value on each balance sheet debt. That is, subsequent measurement should always be at fair value on balance sheet date. The change in fair value in the case NS, a financial asset is classified as FET OCI, then the change in fair value should be recognized in OCI. But if there is a change in fair value for a financial asset classified as FET PL, the change in fair value should be transferred to PNL. The change in fair value is called as gain or loss. Any interest or dividend income on any financial asset should always be transferred to PL. I'll repeat. Irrespective of your classification, you classify the financial asset as amortized cost or you classify it as FET OCI or you classify it as FET PL. Whatever is your classification, initially at the inception of the contract or at the beginning of the transaction, they should always be measured at fair value. The difference emerges only during subsequent measurement on balance sheet date. When I am subsequently measuring on balance sheet date, for a financial asset which is, which is classified as amortized cost should be recognized or should be measured at amortized cost using effective interest rate. While the fair value through OCI or fair value through PNL, if a financial asset gets classified, they should subsequently be measured on balance sheet date only at fair value. However, the difference in fair value arising in a financial asset should be either transferred to OCI or should be transferred to PNL based on their classification. If it is classified as FET OCI, then the change in fair value should be recognized in statement of other comprehensive income. If it is recognized as if it is classified as FET PL, then the difference in fair value should be transferred to PNL. Here, the interest or dividend income on any financial asset, irrespective of their classification, should always be transferred to PNL only. Right. What is this amortized cost? How do I measure amortized cost and how do I represent it at effective interest rate? Before I get into the concept, I'll have one small thing to talk. When I talk about initial measurement, I said initially measure the transaction at fair value. Then my question is, can a transaction cost be considered as fair value? Is transaction cost equal to fair value? Answer is no, we have seen this as a part of India's 113 where I said transaction cost need not be equal to fair value because transaction price at which you enter into a transaction is an entry price, but your fair value is an exit price. The price at which you can sell an asset or transfer a liability. Since I'm talking about financial asset, I'm talking about sale. So a fair value should be an exit price. So your transaction price need not be equal to fair value. Whenever there is a difference between transaction price and fair value, as per India's 113, the difference should be transferred to PNL. As per India's 113, unless another standard proposes an alternative treatment. So this is the standard India's 109, which proposes an alternative treatment.
whenever there is a difference between fair value and transaction price. So what does he say? On initial recognition, transaction price is generally equal to fair value. But if transaction price is not equal to the fair value, then the difference between the fair value and the transaction price should be either transferred to PNL or should be capitalized to the cost of financial asset. I will charge it to PNL if the fair value is a level 1 input. We have heard about this level 1, level 2, level 3 hierarchy under India's 113. So if the fair value is determined as per level 1 input, then the difference between fair value and transaction price should be charged to PNL. But if in case, but if in case the difference between fair value and transaction price, if the fair value is determined either as per level 2 input or is determined as per level 3 input, then it will give you an option of either charging it off to PNL or you can capitalize to the cost of the asset and amortize it over the period of the asset. What is all this? You are talking about fair value. You are saying sometimes transaction price is not equal to fair value. You are saying there could be a difference which could emerge. What is the treatment of the difference? And what is this amortized cost using effective interest rate? Let's you look at one simple illustration where we get a complete overview of the entire concept. I want to give you a complete overview of the entire concept with one single example. I am taking the example of a debt instrument. Okay. Let's say this financial asset right now. My financial asset is a loan to employees the transaction price that means the amount of loan amount of loan for ease of calculation I am taking 1 lakh guys ok this loan carries an interest rate of let us say 6 percent repayment in equal installment in equal installment along with interest at the end of each year for 5 years over 5 years, equal installment will be paid along with interest. Equal installment over 5 years for 1 lakh of a loan is 20,000. So, 20,000 installment for payment of principal along with interest has to be paid. Let us say the effective interest rate, that is the rate at which these employees can borrow the funds from open market is let us say 10%. Ease of calculations, so I am taking 10%. Guys, keep calculating, okay? Keep calculating, I'll tell you how to calculate. So, first one, I'll talk about initial measurement. First measurement Initial measurement should always be at fair value. Let us measure this instrument at its fair value. How do I measure it at fair value? Based on your income approach. What is your income approach? Your income approach of determining fair value is to present a pre uh, to derive a present value of discounted cash flows arising from that instrument. Let's start. Your cash flow discount factor at effective interest rate 
and discounted cash flow. Five years, one, two, three, four, five. Cash flows. Equal installment every year, 20,000 plus interest. Guys, first year, I pay interest on the entire 1 lakh at 6%. 1 lakh into 6% 6 is 6,000 plus your principal repayment of 20,000. The cash flow is 26,000. Next year, the loan outstanding is not 1 lakh, it is 80,000. On 80,000, I am paying 6% interest, that is 4,800. Plus 20,000 of principal repay, 24,800. Third year, the loan outstanding is only 60,000. On 6% rate of interest, I will pay 3,600 along with 20,000 rupees of principal repayment, 23,600. Similarly, if I go for the next two years, it is 22,400 and finally last year, 21,200. Effective interest rate of 10%, find out discount factors and write down. Write down the discount factors guys. 1 divided by 1.1, 0 0.909, 0 0.826. Zero point seven five one point six eight three point six two one. Now you calculate what is your discounted cash flows twenty six thousand into point nine zero nine is 23,624. 24,800 into 0.826. I'll round it off. 20,485. 23,600 into 0.751. 17,724. 22,400 into 0.683. 15,299. Lastly, 21,200 into 0.621. 13,165. Guys, I think your answer will come up to... 90,927. Nine, sorry, 90,297. This is the fair value at which I have to initially recognize the transaction. So you tell me what is the transaction date accounting. This transaction occurred, let's say, on 1st April. So how do I record this transaction on 1st April? First, I'll record the entry, bank loan account debit. Initially should be measured at fair value on the date of transaction, 90,297. But I paid to bank, to bank, how much amount did I pay as a loan to the employee? I paid a total amount of 1 lakh. That means this gives rise to a difference of balancing figure 9703. This is a difference. What should I debit the difference to is the question. This difference which I identified here is a difference between transaction price and fair value. Now, according to this question, whether it is a level 1 input or a level 2 input or a level 3 input. If it is a level 1 input, then I'll have to take a direct quoted market price. Is this a direct quoted market price? No. I used income approach based on the effective interest rate which I, where I discounted the cash flows. Therefore, 100% I did not take a quoted market price. Therefore, this is not a level 1 input.
difference the difference should either be transferred to p and l or should be capitalized to the asset since it is not a level 1 input then in such situation in either of these situations what is the debit which i do the debit should either go into p and l or should be treated as a deferred staff cost it is treated as deferred staff cost what happens to this deferred staff cost this deferred staff cost should be transferred to pnl over 5 years deferred staff cost should be amortized to pnl amortized to pnl over 5 years why because it is not a level 1 input therefore the enterprise has an option either to charge off the entire 9000 change whatever 9703 amount i got directly you put it off to pnl in the same time or you can capitalize it that means you defer it and amortize it to pnl over the term or the life of the financial asset that is what capitalizing to a financial asset means clear now this is the first point which i wanted to drive where in situations where the transaction price and your fair value may not be the same therefore i'll have to give a treatment of the difference in the transaction price and fair value because your financial asset should always be measured at its fair value on the date of initial recognition what about subsequent measure if this is a financial asset this is a debt instrument i'm saying the staff loan if i put it through an instrument level test instrument level test which is nothing but your ccfc test it derives cash flow solely from principal and interest therefore here it should be classified as debt instrument classified as debt instrument such debt instrument should be further classified into FTPL or FTOSA or amortized cost based on the entity level test so therefore this debt instrument will be applied to an entity level test entity level test where under entity level test i will check for the business model let's say the entity's intention is to derive cash flows until maturity entity intends to derive cash flows derive cash flows from principal and interest until maturity in such situation where the entity intends to derive cash flows until maturity it has to be classified as amortized cost initially measured at fair value i've already got the fair value the difference in fair value got treated 
but subsequent measurement should be at fair at amortized cost using effective interest rate so let us look at subsequent measurement then subsequent measurement my subsequent measurement when i wanted to derive i'll go like this here opening amortized cost i'm writing it as ac effective interest which is 10 percent cash flow or repayment finally get your closing amortized cost let's use year 1 2 3 4 and finally 5 opening amortized cost what is the opening amortized cost opening amortized cost is 90,297. 90,297. What is the effective interest? 10%. At 10%, you add this will become 9,030. What is the repayment? First year, I paid 26,000 rupees. Apply. Add interest minus repayment. Get closing. So what is the closing? Just check. 90,297 plus 9,030 minus 26,000 is 73,327. 73,327 at the end of, at the beginning of first year. Add interest plus, plus and minus. Plus interest is 7,333 minus repayment 24,800 is 55,860. Like this, if you keep on going, next year it will be 55,860 plus interest 5,586 minus repayment 23,600 will result in a total amount of plus uh, double five eight six minus twenty three thousand six hundred thirty seven thousand eight forty six like this if you go at the end of fifth year your closing amortized cost should become zero each year when i'm required to pass the accounting entry i will pass the entry like this in year one when i'm passing the entry i'll record Finance. I'll record the entry. Staff loan account debit to interest income. Interest here is income because it is an asset for us. Interest income should be recognized at effective interest rate. Therefore, the amount should be how much did we get? 9030. 9030 subsequent entry should be bank account debit for the amount which i received from the employee towards the staff loan to staff loan amount in the first year is 26000 this entry i will record every year just the amounts keep changing second year interest will be different second year repayment is 24,800 by this manner i will always measure staff loan at closing amortized cost so year one it will be measured at 73,327 second year 55,860 third year 37,846 this is my measurement principle of an amortized cost when it is measured at effective interest rate clear This is exactly what I said. Initial measurement, 
of amortized cost at fair value but subsequently measured at fair value through effective interest rate. When there is a difference between transaction price and fair value, it should be either charged to PNL or if the if it is a level 1 input, but if it is a level 2 or level 3 input, then either you can transfer it to fair value or you can capitalize it to the cost of the asset. Here we got the difference, it was not a level 1 input. So I told you it is at the option. Either you transfer it to PNL now itself or transfer it to PNL over the next 5 years. Clear with the concept?